Friday episode of the Dog and Bandits. I'm Warren Phillips, and we have a phenomenal guest today. Uh, this man is an artist in every aspect of the word. His name is Rick Parker. Uh, for comic fans, you might know him best for his run on the Beavis and Butthead comics from Marvel. He's done art in so many different mediums. Um, this is an absolutely fascinating man. Uh, I think you're really going to love this interview. He's very honest about his career and all that he's done. He's also former military, so we want to thank him for his service, the time he spent uh, with the Army. So without further ado, here is Rick Parker. Uh, Rick Parker. Rick, thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. So we'll start at the very, very beginning. How did you first discover comics? Well, um, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> so um, I thought about it, and I think I have to say that uh, my grandmother played a huge role in my love of pic of picture books. Mm -hmm. She was a 12-year-old girl in 1900, and that was sort of the heyday of some of the wonderful newspaper comic strips in the country, like Little Nemo in Slumberland and you know, just different, uh, the cats and jammer kids and just different things. So I think she fell in love with comics first. Okay. I think she fell in love with comics, you know, when she was a girl. And um, we went to live with my grandmother when I was a month old. So uh, being an only child with two parents who both worked, I got to spend a lot of time with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. so I got to spend even more time with my grandmother when she fell and broke her hip and never walked again. Oh, bro. which happened when I was about, you know, four years old. So, you know, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother and, you know, she read to me. And uh, in, in addition to the Bible, I got the newspaper strips and children's books that were given to me, you know, as gifts. And, uh, you know, we had a great time. It was even before I could read. So I got to look at the pictures and I was thinking the other day that was probably good for me because I was looking at the pictures and I was trying to make sense out of out of pictures before I could even read. And I think that in some way, you know, helped me a lot in my own creative work. But um, she was she was great. And, uh, you know, we 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 read Little Orphan Annie and uh, trying to remember all of them. Uh, there was one called Bringing Up Father uh, that was um, uh, George McManus was that was a great strip. And when I was a kid, I actually thought that the people in the comic strips were real people. And, uh, you know, I, they look like some of the people who were my parents, friends and my grandmother's friends. My father had an aunt named Maggie. And one of the main characters was Jigs and Maggie. And I thought Maggie was that character in the comic strip. <laughs> so I mean, it, be it became like the kid that lived next door to me was named Henry. Mm -hmm. And he looked just like the comic character Henry from the strip Henry. And uh, it was very strange. I began to think, and still to this very day, whenever I meet somebody, I try to figure out, you know, which comic character is he? <laughs> now I'm looking now. I'm looking at your face, Orin, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, which of the character, which of the comic characters you remind me of. Maybe a little bit of the Hulk, a little bit, except you're not green. But you know, I'll say it. No. Okay. Anyway, I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, that's, I think she got me. She got me started, and um, I always loved looking at pictures. You know, I've been pictures just are mesmerizing to me. You know, they just allow you to, for your imagination to just run wild. I was going to say, so, it seems like yeah. with you, art is such a huge part of who you are and what you do. How did that love of art, because you, and we'll talk about it later on, because you work in various different mediums, but how did that love of art begin? Well, I, I see you did your homework, Oren. That's really nice. <laughs> there you it's go. nice to be interviewed by somebody that, you know, you can tell that they actually looked at your work before they started <laughs> talking to you. I just love, I just love pictures. Uh, you know, my parents were working and I had, I was an only child and, you know, we had a somebody gave us a, my parents bought a set of the world book encyclopedia in 1952 when i was six years old and i remember turning to the to the a the a book and the a book had art and and there was about a 12 page supplement or something in there that just showed some of some of what they thought were the greatest artworks that you know had ever been done mm -hmm. and you know there was a, a, a toulouse poster by toulouse lautrec you know, there were reproductions of paintings by Picasso. There was um, a painting uh, by an, a French artist named Henri Rousseau that was uh, a, 
uh, had a bunch of animals, wild animals in a jungle scene. Mm -hmm. And just looking at those pictures, you know, you could just, you know, your imagination could just kind of run wild. And um, I like to draw. I discovered that I, I like to draw. And I thought everybody could draw. <laughs> and I thought I thought that it's just something that everybody can do. And I found out, you know, when I was about seven years old that actually, no, uh, everybody can't draw. You know, in fact, I could draw. And that was something that kind of gave me, you know, made me separated me from the other kids. You know, I was a I was a little boy who was very short and very thin and very shy and uh, not popular, especially with the other kids. Mm -hmm. So um you know, being a reject, mm -hmm. you know, not good in sports, being a reject, I got to spend a lot of time by myself. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, my father brought home paper from the railroad. He was a telegraph operator. Mm -hmm. And when the roll of paper on the machine started getting really low and they had to change it, otherwise they would lose the information, the paper, the color of the paper turned uh, kind of from a pale yellow to kind of a pale pink. And that was the sign that you have to change the role. Mm -hmm. And so when he took, he changed the role and rather than just throw the roll of pink paper away, he'd bring that home and he'd show me how to, you know, to tear off sheets that were approximately eight and a half by 11 and, you know, gave me those to draw on. Mm -hmm. And as a railroad employee, he got free pencils. So he brought home some pencils. He showed me how to sharpen a pencil. Mm -hmm. I got to draw, you know, on the railroad paper with the railroad pencils. And, um, you know, it was just so much fun. I drew things like uh, frogmen, um, you know, d divers that were discovering treasure among, you know, the rotting hulks of sunken ships, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, I was a big I grew up in the 50s and, you know, horror movies were a, a big deal back in those days. And they had shows on television, you know, that were scary. And, you know, that was all very exciting. So naturally, I was going to do lots of pictures of monsters and you know uh when famous monsters of filmland magazine came out i thought this is the greatest thing i've ever seen in my life <laughs> and they had a lot of movie stills of frankenstein and the mummy and the werewolf and dracula and all of that stuff so you know i got to draw all of that stuff one time um there was a knock at the door and um the maid went to the door we had a, a lovely woman that worked for us helped take care of my grandmother and she said, Ricky, there's some boys here. They want to see you. And I thought, great. You know, finally, I'm, you know, people want to be my friend, you know. So anyway, uh, they there were about six or seven guys and they came into the house and they just wanted to see my room because I had put up all these posters of all these drawings of these monsters and things all over the walls of my room. It was I guess it was my first official, you know, a gallery show. <laughs> anyway, um, after, you know, after about a minute and a half, they left and I was feeling, you know, kind of. Um, you know, a little bit uh, let down, you know, but, you know, that's how I realized that I can, I can get people to pay attention to me. And mm -hmm. apparently I've got a, I have a pathological need for attention, apparently. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, it's, it's a long story and it'll all be coming out in a graphic novel one of these days, hopefully in a couple of years, I've already started on it. You okay. Know? So, um, you know, it's the story of my life as an artist in New York. You know, mm -hmm. I came to New York when I was 26. Uh, I didn't know what kind of artist I wanted to be. But I figured, you know, it would all work out. <laughs> it took a, it's taken a long time to start to work out, but you know, I'm getting there, you know, another 10 years, man. You know, I want to jump back because you said you were a shy child, but yeah. for what you did, putting your art out there takes bravery because you're expressing yourself and people are either like it or they're not going to like it. And that takes courage to do that. When did you find the courage? to put your art out there for folks to see and, you know, and go with what, how they felt about it. Well, Oren, I think I really wanted to be a stand-up comedian. I think that yeah. uh, Jerry Lewis was kind of like my hero when I was a kid. I just thought Jerry Lewis was just the funniest guy, you know? And uh, I could, I knew I couldn't be a stand-up comedian because you have to stand up in front of a crowd of people and they're looking at you. Right. But the nice, the nice thing about doing your artwork and your artwork, you know, is represented, it's representative of you. There's, you know, you come through in your work, but you put your work out there and people are looking at the work. They're not looking at you. Right. And a lot of, you know, I think the best artwork is kind of open to interpretation. So mm -hmm. when they look at something, part of what they see isn't just what, what you've put there, but it's like what 
what else is in their own mind? All of the experiences that they've had in their in their life, you know, they bring to it. So no two people see the same thing. But I, I felt I felt completely comfortable with people looking at my work. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first time that ever happened was I was seven years old and um, in in the second grade, and in the public school that I went to. Uh, that they gave out paper and and a box of crayons at the beginning of the year. And I think there was one day a week where you had an hour or so where you got to draw. And I looked forward to that. (laughs) And anyway, I drew a sinking ship in a storm, sending out an SOS signal. And um, and the teacher liked it so much that she put it up on the, on the blackboard, taped it up or held it up to the blackboard. And all the kids were looking at it and the teacher was saying nice things about this drawing. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I just, you know, felt, you know, all of this love, I guess, I don't know. And uh, I, it was a good feeling. It lasted for about 10 seconds. And, you know, I've been trying to recreate that feeling as many times as possible ever since. But, um, you know, it's, you know, drawing is an escape for me. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I've never, I've never really sort of felt like I fit in or mm-hmm. was uh, comfortable in the real world. Mm-hmm. I was much, I was always much more comfortable in the world of, of my own imagination. And uh, and that's where I've tried to, um, you know, to to spend as much time as possible. Well, that leads to this thing. And, and I want to recognize, I also want to thank you for your service to this country. But when you well, got, I didn't do it, I didn't volunteer, you know. Well, yeah, you it were took me. but I wasn't from, I wasn't going to run off to Canada. But, you know, yeah. But I mean, as you said, you were someone who would like to be in your own world, moving to the military, which is a whole world unto itself. That had to be uh, a shock to the system. Scary. It yeah. was scary. I mean, I couldn't. I couldn't believe my mother let that happen to me. Yeah, I was really an overly protected. My mother overprotected me. Right. And you know, I mean, you know, they wouldn't let me have a BB gun, for example. You know, every kid, I thought every boy should have a BB gun. Right. But they were smart. They knew I would use the BB gun to shoot somebody in the face. <laughs> which I went over to somebody else's house, and he had a BB gun, and we were playing with it. I wound up shooting him in the in the eye it hit him like right oh. there but um you know fortunately he didn't lose his his sight mm-hmm. but my mother my mother was very reluctant to let me drive the family car you know when i got to be 18 in georgia where i grew up you could be 16 you could get your driver's license and i knew other kids that were 16 that were you know that were getting cars and driving them and it just looked like so much fun but my mother knew me well enough to know that i would that would probably go out and you know get killed if i had my own car but uh you know, it was kind of interesting, you know, um, you know, I was a Boy Scout and that helped. I remember when I was in the Army, I was thinking, wow, this the Boy Scout training really has come in handy. Mm-hmm. And then I took ROTC in in high school because I didn't want to have to take my clothes off in the shower in front of, a, you know, have to take a shower with other guys. Yeah. You know, that just didn't seem like something I wanted to do. But um, so ROTC was a little bit of a help. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I was in pretty good shape. I mean, a lot of guys that a lot of guys that got, got drafted, you know, were in their early 20s. And, you know, they you know, they weren't in the best condition, but I was 19 years old and, you know, I would. 160 pounds. And by that time, I guess I was about five feet, 11. I was in good shape and that really helped a lot. But, um, you know, it was scary th- being thrown in with a whole bunch of people that, you know, I didn't know from mm-hmm. all over the country really and mostly in the east Uh, there were people from north carolina north new york all different places and and people from all sorts of backgrounds that you know were not used to that were people who i was not used to really uh you know being associated with Mm -hmm. so it was a little bit uh, it was pretty scary and but i knew that uh if i just did what they said you know i'd had i would have a pretty good chance to you know, to make it through. And uh, I did, I was always a picky eater. I ate whatever the army put in front of me. I wanted to build myself up. I was going to be as strong as I possibly could. And <laughs> you do a lot of exercise in the army in basic training is, you know, lots of push ups and side straddle hops and squat thrusts and all this other stuff. And you're running, you're a lot of running. So I was in, I was in pretty good shape. Why um, did, at what point did you decide to put that, all those me- stories together for drafted? Oh, yeah, that's a thank you. That's an excellent question. Well, um, you know, I hope this doesn't, you know, I don't want to make people feel bad or anything. But, you know, when, you know, you just get to a certain point in your life when the when the phone just stops ringing, 
Right. You know, I was always kind of in demand for different kinds of work. And uh, in in 2013, um, the phone stopped ringing. I didn't have any any work. So I said to myself, well, uh, you know, if the world doesn't have any use for you, you better come up with some use for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm like uh, in my late 60s. I thought I would. I, th I thought you've had an interesting life. Why don't you start writing about your life? And so I just uh, I got this. Uh, blogs were popular back then. Yeah. So I got a. I, I started working on a blog and I started writing about my childhood. Mm -hmm. And then um, and this I was shocked. Or and the the stories just came pouring out. And um, I realized uh, that um, when you stop when you start to write about your life things that you thought that you had forgotten they're still there they come back you know I, I sort of feel like everything that i've ever seen every experience that i've ever had is stored away in our in our brains mm -hmm. and you know it's, it's like a big hotel room with thousands of rooms and there's stuff in every one of those rooms there are people and e memories in every one of those rooms yep. and some of those rooms people have pulled furniture up against the door and it's hard to get in there. But if you can clear the furniture away from the door and get in there, you'd be surprised. You know, this stuff just got, starts coming back. Well, um, that went on for most of 2014. Just I wrote almost every day. I, I started writing about different things that had happened to me in my life. And, or just if I went to the drugstore and, you know, had an interesting experience in, in line at the pharmacy, you know, I, I could write about that. Or when, when we moved from New Jersey, I wrote about that, you know, and, and um, I discovered that, hey, I, I really like writing. I never thought of myself as a writer before. So this was a great thing to discover something good about yourself that you didn't know you had. I mean, I kind of wish I'd discovered that earlier <laughs> because, you know, a lot of artists feel like, you know, they're somewhat dependent upon writers or they can't really, in comics especially, you know, artists and writers team up. But, you know, it's I think it's a great you know, it's it's very rare when you actually find somebody that you really click with. Lots of times, although I got to write with some very some very talented people, you know, I didn't know it. I didn't always click with them, and it wasn't it wasn't their fault. It you know, it's just because it's just because of, you know, it's just because, you know, of me. You know, um, other they you know other people might have clicked with them but you know but you know we we managed to work it out i always thought the hardest part for me in getting an illustration job was first of all you got to figure out what the person wants what does the writer want you know they've given you this script and is supposed all the information is in the script but first of all you have to figure out what what do they want you know and then you have to do the artwork it's like it's like it's a two part process you know mm -hmm. the doing the artwork was the easy part figure out what they wanted that was always the hard part for me but um i discovered once i discovered i was a writer i thought hey wow i didn't know i could do this maybe i could maybe i could uh, maybe i could write about my own life yeah. you know um i i worked with harvey pekar in the last year of his life in 2010 um, Dean Haspiel uh, invited me to do some work with him, and uh, there were three other artists on the what was called the PCAR project. Mm -hmm. It was edited by uh, Jeff Newalt in New York, really smart guy. But um, I always thought it was wonderful. I remember when I when I first saw PCAR's work in like '85 or '86, somebody gave me a copy of American Splendor, and I'd been working in Marvel for about ten years, and I sort of knew that comics could be th about things other than superheroes. You know, I read horror comics. I read EC comics when I was a kid. You know, I was a bit a big Mad Magazine fan, you know, like in 58 when that when I got my hands on that, it just, you know, rocked my world. You know, I saw, you know, Jack Davis's, you know, uh, artwork, you know, when I was seven or eight years old. And, you know, I just love that, you know, that stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, I can't remember what I was going to say, but um, yeah, it was. It was it was like a realization. Oh, I don't need a writer anymore. I can do I can write the stories and I can illustrate them and I can kind of tailor them to my strengths. Right. You know, as an artist, you're often asked to draw something that is really kind of outside your comfort zone. And I think that artists should do that. I always advise any young artist that will listen to me. Don't be afraid to go outside your comfort zone. If there's something that you don't like to draw, uh, maybe buildings or trees or cars or motorcycles or whatever it is, just go ahead and draw that until you don't suck at it anymore. <laughs> you know? But um, anyway, anyway, uh, so that was kind of off to the races. Once I realized, you know, I knew I could letter, I'd lettered all those books from Marvel. Mm 
Yeah. And I knew I could color because I've been an I've been an artist looking at you know colors. I have a degree. I have two degrees in art. Mm-hmm. I knew I could color. So I the writing was kind of the last piece that you know fell into place for me, and it was great. You know, um, I I did you know a lot of artists I think they wait until they're ready or they don't think they're ready yet. But um, I think that um, I think that when you get to be a certain age, you realize that you don't get to live forever. You know, there's a certain pressure that the clock is ticking. I just said, fuck it. I'm going to sit down and 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 do a story about my experiences in the Army. Yeah. That was a really interesting period of my life. And uh, one of the nice things that I discovered, Oren, is that when you start working on a project like that and you're into it like 20 pages or so, you know, you're drawing yourself and and suddenly you're back there again. You know, you're with those people again. You're you're 20 years old again. And man, I'll tell you, it's great to be 20 years old again when you're 67 years old, you know. <laughs> but uh, I felt, you know, I, I, you know, you go into this this uh, magical zone where you it, you're in that world again. And then, you know, s- six hours go by. I'm sure this happens to anybody that gets involved in any kind of creative work. This is really um, a, a, just a wonderful experience. And anybody that's ever had that experience, you know, you want to re- you want to repeat that as often as you possibly can, you know. But um, so anyway, I'm very curious, though, because you've done comic art, you have art that's in galleries and you've also have done writing. Mm. Could you have seen yourself focusing on strictly one or did you need all three of the, or did you need all these different things to create who you are now? Now, when I was um, about 16 years old, I guess when other kids were, you know, on dates or maybe playing basketball in the gym or something, I was in the library at Savannah High School reading Art Forum magazine. And uh, Art Forum magazine was a very interesting magazine to me because one of the articles in there they talked about this guy named Leo Castelli, who was a dealer in New York, and he discovered Andy Warhol. Okay. And he and they showed the work of Andy Warhol, and he, you know, he he was he would take like a, a soup can and make a painting of that. Mm-hmm. And there was another artist named Jasper Johns who who took a Maxwell House coffee can and made a a bronze uh, uh, sculpture that looked and then painted it to look exactly like a Maxwell House coffee can with paint brushes in there. And I just thought that 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 is so cool, you know, and, and Roy Lichtenstein was another one of the artists. And I know that he's a very controversial figure, you know, in the art world. A lot of people think that he ripped off, you know, the comic artists and stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, I sort of feel like, um, you know, what he did was, uh, you know, that's the subject matter that he used. And but I think it, my own personal opinion is that what he did is very different from what they did. Okay. You know, he, he, but but anyway, you know, we can argue about that. We can talk about that some other time. And more, Todd, if you're listening, I'll argue with you about that anytime. <laughs> but um, no, but I wanted to be a fine artist. I went to New York. I When I got out of the Army, I went back to university. I went to college at the University of Georgia and I majored in painting and drawing. Mm-hmm. And then my my thing was, I mean, the, what you were supposed to do is you're supposed to go to New York and find yourself as an artist, find who you are, you know. And, uh, you know, I was I was. I was not very confident at a lot of things. I was, I wasn't, I was, I, fortunately, I was a very healthy person. I didn't have any health problems, but, you know, my, in my dealings with other people, you know, I really, you know, I, I didn't, there were a lot of things that I needed to learn about how to, how to get along well with other people. So I wasn't really comfortable in that situation. Mm-hmm. Also, I was a very impulsive person who often said a lot of things that got me into trouble. Mm-hmm. But um, I felt very confident in, in, in my abilities as an artist. You know, after all, I mean, I had been I had been thinking of myself as an artist, you know, since I was seven years old, because that's what I could do. Other people had other things that they were good at. That's what I was good at. <clears throat> I also found that I could make people laugh. And I was very badly behaved in school because I would often say things out loud when I wasn't supposed to that would get me in trouble. <laughs> but it was worth it because all the kids, it cracked up all the kids and they laughed at me. And then for, you know, for like a few seconds there, you know, I felt that, uh, you know, I felt loved, you know. <laughs> but um, anyway, I wanted to be a fine artist. And I went to New York and I was 26 and um, I was I was exhibiting my work to the public in my own in the window of my own studio and people were seeing it. Um, I was getting into, I got into a group show 
I uh, got into other shows and people liked my work and I liked what I was doing. And, you know, I got written up in the newspaper and, and magazines and stuff. And, uh, but I never was able to make any money at it. And so I said, I've got to do something. I'm 30 years old now. And I kind of told myself, if you're 30 years old and you haven't made it as an artist and you're not, you're not one of Leo Castelli's artists and you're not in some big loft somewhere with a skylight, you know, <laughs> painting, big paintings and easels and stuff. And he's sending you a check every month for $3,000 so that you don't have to worry about paying your rent and you got something to eat. I never, I would have been happy eating, you know, like bologna sandwiches and, and drinking cheap beer. I mean, I was prepared to suffer. That didn't bother me, you know, at all. And I guess I did my fair share of suffering. <laughs> but um, I had I had met a girl when I was in graduate school who I was interested in. And uh, walking her to the subway one night, um, I asked her out. And it was like about nine, nine or 10 o'clock at night when class was over. And um, I said, would you like to go out with me for a cup of coffee? And I didn't have enough money to take her out for dinner. But and she said, no, I can't do that. And I, Why not? And she, I, I have to go home and work. So what kind of work do you do? He says, well, I'm a freelance letterer for Marvel Comics. Hmm. I'd never heard of Marvel Comics. You know, I was like 16 years old when Spider-Man, you know, came out in 62 right. or was it 64. I don't remember. But anyway, yep. you know, I just I was not into, you know, I, I kind of stopped reading comics with um, with Mad Magazine, I guess, in the late 50s. And uh, I started reading comics again in the early in the late in the early 70s when National Lampoon came out. To me, National Lampoon was like an extension of of it was Mad Magazine for young adults, you know. But anyway, so June took me up to Marvel because she was turning in pages one day. We started dating and she said, you want to go up to the office with me? And I said, sure. And meet some of the people I work with and said, sure. So we went up there and uh, what a great group of people. Um, you know, they were getting ready to go see a screening of The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody was going around, I don't know who it was, saying, hey, do you want to go? Do you want to go? And these people were all Marv Wolfman and Lynn Wein and I guess Ar Archie Goodwin and a whole bunch of people were heading over there. And uh, I went with them. And before the movie started, you know, they were just sitting out in the audience and the lights were on. They were just trading, you know, funny comments among themselves. Mm -hmm. And when the movie started, they were making funny comments out loud because there were no other audience members. They could say whatever the hell they wanted to. And it was so they were so funny. I remember thinking, what a great group of people. These are the funniest people. Um, I would love to work at a place like this, but I didn't feel like I and I thought that I could do. I saw what June was doing. She was lettering comic books. And, you know, I thought, well, I could do that. And, you know, she was making like three hundred dollars a week, which was in 1973 was a lot of money. And I had a terrible job, you know, working for a furniture designer in Brooklyn where I was standing at a at a grinding wheel all day. And, you know, when I at the end of the day, my hands were bloody from my hands hitting this wheel and I was making three dollars an hour. So anyway, to make a long story short, she just one day she told me she was getting married and moving to Tucson. <laughs> And, oh, wow. I didn't, when did you even have time to you know see anybody? I mean, I thought I'd been <laughs> occupying her time. But uh, anyway, you know, so and then I be, and later on, I became a cab driver and I was driving up Madison Avenue and I saw uh, Stan Lee come out of 575 Madison Avenue. And I remember that. Oh, yeah, that's the place that my girlfriend took me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My girlfriend's married now and she's <laughs> living in Tucson, Arizona. I think if I went up there, maybe I could get work because, you know, I did draw. Right. And you know, when I went up there and, you know, they looked at uh, Dan Adkins, looked at my portfolio and I don't want to give away too much of the story because all of these things that I'm telling you are going to be in, in my graphic novel. Yeah. But this is the kind of stuff, you know, that's in my book, you know, and it's so, it's so interesting to look back on your life. Uh, so many things become, one of the things that really became clear to me uh, from doing this is how everything is connected. You know, it isn't like the fine art is just in a in a box all by itself. Right. It, it's connected to the comic art. And it's it's everything is one thing is connected to every everything's connected to everything else. You don't always see the connections and they're not always obvious, but they're there. You know, if you really examine something, you can sort of see how you went from one one place, you know, to the next. But um, you know, 
it's it was it was uh, fun doing the book about the army. But my my life wasn't really about being in the army. You know, my life was really about being an artist. And you know, to be able to to, to be able to do a, a graphic novel, a two hundred and fifty page book about that is something that I'm really you know really looking forward to. And I think that'll be my my magnum opus. You know, you and if I live if I live long enough, I would then like to tackle my childhood. It so goes there. <laughs> three books out there, my One childhood. <laughs> and my childhood, then getting drafted in the army, which is a which is a big distraction for three years, yeah. and then going to you know going to New York and being an artist in New York. And mm -hmm. when I when I left New York in 1997, um, I had the last project I had done for Marvel was Beavis and Butthead. Right. So I'd like to think that I kind of went out on you know on a high note. You know, <laughs> I started Marvel. I started working in Marvel. You know, in the I was working in the production department. And then when I left, I was working on one of the top comic books, one of the best-selling comic books in the country. And then I never worked for Marvel again. Yeah. So then, you, then you've got another period of time from the time that you were out on the street, basically not knowing what to do until, you know, I guess, I don't know when, I don't know when the thing would end. But there's another section that if I live long enough, I could tell another story about what happened to me after I lost my job. And I wasn't the only person, you know, there were so many people at Marvel that just got, they were just, you know, just turned out on the street. I mean, my wife, Lisa, was writing Barbie comics and that was uh, uh, Mattel on the rights to that. Mm -hmm. And Ronald Perelman decided that he didn't want to pay people to draw stories that Marvel didn't own the rights to. So all licensed material, all licensed, all people who work in licensed material got the ax. And then they started, I think, um, I'm not an expert on this, but it's, and I think people have written book, good books about it, about what happened at Marvel. You know, they pared down the company to make it look really profitable. You know, they fired lots of the employees. So, you know, it looked good on paper. Then they took it public. You know, um, I think, um, you know, that was, you know, it was a bad thing, you know, um, but every, you know, one of the things I want to remind everybody is that every, all good things come to an end. So enjoy, if something good is going on in your life, enjoy it while you can, because you never know when it's going to be taken away from you. And if something is taken away from you, you, you have to also remember that they cannot take away whatever is good about you. They cannot take that away from you. They can take, they can take their job away from you. But if, but if you are, if you've got something to offer the world, they can't take that away from you and don't let them, don't let anybody take that away from you. I sort of felt like, uh, you know, I, I was a little, I didn't know exactly what to do with myself there for a few years. And um, Dwayne McDuffie kind of came to my rescue. He and Matt Wayne had written a, uh, a story called The Road to Hell. And in those days, it was, this is going about 2004, somewhere in that area. Uh, lots of uh, comics were being made into movies. And I think that's what uh, Dwayne and, and Matt were hoping would happen. But he, um, he gave me a script for a 168 page graphic novel. And I had never done a graphic novel before. So, you know, um, it took me about a year to do it, but I finished it. And there's an ash can available. And some of the artwork in there was pretty good. But, you know, there's some things in there that, uh, you know, I'd rather not anybody look at. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's all a, it's all a process. You know, when you're whether you're learning how to play guitar, whether you learn how to draw comics or whatever it is, you've got to just grit your teeth and just fight through, you know, the drawing of the figure or whatever it is. And also or in before I started after I told you I started uh, after, in 2015, I kind of ran out of. Mm -hmm. stories to write on my blog and now I, fuck it now i'm gonna have to draw something right. I, I took that army part but then i wasn't really happy with my figure drawing right. so then i had to go i had to i had to go back and and sort of feel it make myself into the artist figure drawing artist i wanted to be because you know people being the number one subject matter in art you got to feel comfortable drawing people and I finally came to the conclusion after about a year and thousands of drawings of figures. I know you can't see it behind me, but there's a cabinet there full of full of notebooks and it's all full of paper, pages of drawing of figures. Uh, can I give a tip to young artists that are trying to learn how to draw the figure? Please. Draw the figure smaller rather than larger. If you can fit like 10 figures on one piece of paper, you can you can learn just as much about the muscles and how the arm goes into the shoulder and all of that stuff by drawing a small 
drawing as you can by doing a large one. And by doing the small drawings, you can get much more work done because it just takes longer to draw a big, a big drawing. But uh, finally, I realized, you know, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, Wally Wood or, you know, or who, name your favorite figure artist, you know. Um, oh, gosh, uh, I, I, wanted to, I was going to say Frank Frazetta, but, you know, the, he really drew beautiful, you know, figures and so many other artists, so many great artists have done that. But I finally said, well, I'm good enough to tell a story. You know, the, the beautiful thing about comics is that the readers cut you a lot of slack. You know, they do. You know, you don't have to be able to draw like Michelangelo in order to, you know, to be a good comic artist. You have to be able to tell a story. That's the most important part. And the story's got to be a good story. Yep. Because no matter how great the artwork is, if the story isn't any good, people are just going to do something else. <laughs> and they're going to do something else anyway. But you right. don't want them to do something else until you know they finished reading your your story. <laughs> so, and and you know I'm I just I'm I'm very very conscious of trying to 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 tell the story in a in a way that is not confusing, mm -hmm. so that the person can understand exactly what's going on. Because I the other thing is that you know uh, there's a lot of things that can get in between the the story and the mind of the reader, and you want to you know that are confusing to that person. You know, the the lettering would be one of them. You know, it's, the lettering is if the lettering isn't good or if the balloons aren't placed properly and there's some confusion about which balloon you're supposed to read next. Mm -hmm. Or is that figure there is the same guy that I saw on page 21? You know, that kind of stuff. So all of that stuff, you got to be as good as anybody with that. But you don't have to be able to, you know, to draw like uh, Wally Wood. Although Hillary Barta can draw like Wally Wood. You yeah. know, and there's other people that can do it too. That's a <laughs> shout out to Hillary Barta. Hillary Barta, I finally got to meet him in Chicago. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, he was, some, he was one of the artists who I really always loved his work because mm -hmm. I could sort of identify with his work. You know, when I was at Marvel, all I was seeing mostly was, you know, superhero stuff. And, you know, I wasn't a superhero artist. You know, I didn't get it. I didn't understand superheroes. I didn't understand, you know, what the deal was with them. So it was, it was kind of... Um, you know, I felt like um, a fish out of water, you know, to a certain extent. You know, I mean, I was a, you know, maybe I was a saltwater fish in a freshwater pond or <laughs> there was a dead fish in a freshwater pond. I don't know. But anyway, um, bits and pieces, you know, there were people who would come in like Marie Severin was in the office in those days. And she was a phenomenally talented, uh, a genius cartoonist, really. And um, I used to see things that she did. And I used to love, you know, looking at her work. It really gave me, you know, a lot of a lot of hope. Yeah. And Hilary Barter was another one of those artists. When I saw his work, I thought, yeah, yeah, I could kind of do something like that. You know, people were always telling me you should be working at Mad Magazine. You know, the editor in chief at Marvel said you should be working at Mad Magazine. I'm thinking, <laughs> wait a minute, I've been working here for 10 years. I mean, uh, what, you don't like me? You don't like having me? I wanted to do something at Marvel. Right. You know, I wanted, I was always with uh, Howard the Duck. I, when I saw Howard the Duck, I thought I could. That's the kind of comic I could. I could do something, you know. Right. But Howard the Duck was over with, you know. When I got to Marvel, it had been over with for a couple of years. They just weren't doing humor work at Marvel. But um, anyway, if you, I guess I'm living proof that if you stick, if you live long enough, and you keep plugging away, you know, eventually, you know, you'll get to do something. But um, my big break at Marvel was getting to do Beavis and Butthead comic book, which was really great. It was already, it was already popular, you right. know, when I started on it. And, you know, it was like, you, you, you know, you're going to, the only way you can lose is if you really, you know, mess it up, you know, but <laughs> uh, I, I put my own kind of mark on it. I'm not too sure if Mike judge really uh, loved the comic book that much, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I did, the, I told the story that they wrote Mm -hmm. And I used to, I made it look like the characters. They seemed to want to care. They cared that it looked like the characters, but, but we added a lot of stuff to, and the, and the right Marvel writers, uh, Marvel after the issue number five, they, they fired Mike Lackey because the, I think not because he wasn't doing a good job. He was doing a great job, but the, but the editors, I mean, the writers at MTV who were doing the animated Asian shorts, they heard how much money that, that the writer was making on, royalties and stuff like that although they don't they don't call them royalties they're incentive bonuses right and they insisted that they be given you know the project to write and what they tried to do is to just recycle you know some uh, some animation scripts i think that had been rejected but um 
you know, uh, I, I used to, you know, people used to joke, you know, they used to kind of make fun of Beavis and Butthead comic book. I said, well, it's the only comic book I know that's being written by Harvard graduates. Right. And those people were Harvard graduates. And the stories were good. You right. know, there was plenty of room there for me to add my own, you know, things going on in the story. You know, you can you can see you can twist something and give it a, a whole show it in a whole new light. You know, I I, I loved uh, Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elder's work on Mad Magazine when I was growing up. And, you know, Will just went crazy adding stuff. You know, Harvey was kind of a, you know, uh a, a, a genius who just went over the work and over the work, kept adding, adding more stuff. And Will Elder just added more stuff on top of that. And that was kind of like the model that I used on Beavis and Butthead. A lot of stuff that uh, there's in the comic book was not in the script, but it was really, you know, you got to make it fun for yourself. You know, I mean, you got it. Life is like that too. You have to make your life enjoyable for yourself. Nobody else is going to do it for you. If you're looking for somebody else to, you know, to, make your life interesting you better look in the mirror because that's the person that can that that can really do it for you you know right. all was, right well I've, I've been rambling on incessantly here i don't know these are awesome stories i i just wanted because somebody you met along the way was jim salakrup um, yeah who's one such of my a, best buddies i say one of the nicest people in the industry um one of the smartest people in the industry yeah i mean i was i was about to get into uh paper cuts because mm. kind of ahead of the curve because right now the graphic novel market is on fire um yeah. what was it like for you working uh with paper cuts and talk a little bit about jim himself well jim is the if there was mark gruenwald and jim salakrop are the two people that i can point to who really and glenn hurdling of course who's the editor of beavis and butthead who really gave me the breaks that i needed to make the transition from just being a person who lettered comic books to somebody who could also you know um write and draw material that they would publish and uh steve saffle too i guess you know who was at marvel age uh mag marvel age comic book deserves some credit too but jim was uh, early on um i started uh, because i'd lettered the spider-man strip and the hulk strip i got interested in comic strips i like the idea of telling a story in three or four panels and, you know, Stan was such a good writer. I mean, you know, say what you want to about Stan Lee. That guy knew how to tell a story, and especially in, in three or four panels, you know, and make you – I got interested in it. I mean, I wasn't even thinking of myself as a comic book fan. For the first 10 years or so I was working in comics, I was still thinking, I'm a fine artist. I'm doing this other work. I'm just – I'm working in comics because I just need to make a living so I can still do fine art. But I gradually became more and I fell in love with comics. I became more and more interested in comics. And, you know, make, doing the strip for Stan Lee made me want to do a strip for myself. So um, I took a look around at the world that I was living in. And I had this eccentric friend named George. And I thought he would be a great subject for a cartoon uh, strip. He lived by himself. He was a World War II veteran. Yeah. You know, he was single. He was unemployed. You know, he just had lots of time on his hands. And he would often come over to my place and hang out. And plus, he had a really great laugh. And he would laugh at things that I said. I mean, just loved have, having him around. Anyway, I did a, I did a comic strip of, uh, about him. And there must have been like maybe 15 or 20 of them. And Jim Salakrup saw that and he was interested in it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I thought, wow, I mean, that's that's interesting. You know, a Marvel Comics uh, editor is interested in something I did. Right. And, uh, you know, when he became... You know, we worked in the bullpen, you know, uh, he was he was in the Marvel bullpen for a while in 1984. And he, he was the guy is so talented. He's really unbelievable. He's so fun. He's got a mind. It's just very quick. Somebody would come into the bullpen, you know, to visit somebody and then maybe say something and then walk out. And he would whip out a piece of paper and some magic markers and he'd do a cartoon of that person. And it would be, you know, a funny idea. And, you know, I just love that stuff. And he was he was throwing them in the trash can. I fished out, you know, most of his material out of the trash can. I could probably put out a book of, of his work actually, but, um, you know, so, you know, we got to be, you know, we got to be buddies, I guess, really when he was working in the Marvel bullpen. Then when he became the editor of uh, Spider-Man, he gave me a lot of work mm -hmm. and it was because uh, my name was Parker and he wanted to be, he said he wanted to be able to yell Parker, you know, <laughs> like J. Jonah Jameson or something. But no, Jim was, he, he got me. 
Yeah. You know, and I think that, you know, in relationships, whether it's a romantic relationship or a friend relationship or a professional relationship, you got to be with people who get you, who see you for, for what you are and what makes you the special person that you are. You know, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with these other people. It's just not everybody is going to not everybody's going to get you, you know, so you got to if you're lucky enough to discover who those people are, you know, you better hold them, hold them tight. Anyway, uh, when Jim took over, um, when Jim started uh, working at Paper Cuts and they wanted to do parodies of famous children's books and movies like the Harry Potter thing and Twilight and all that stuff, uh, you know, he asked me if I would do them and they brought back Tales from the Crypt. In 2007, uh, I was I was kind of at a loss of what to do, and the phone rang, and Jim said, "We're bringing back Tales from the Crypt." And um, Tales from the Crypt was a comic book that I had read when I was a kid, and it really freaked me out. I mean, that long-haired guy, the Crypt Keeper, with his long white hair, who was looking directly at the reader of the comic book and talking to him. I mean, you know, you know, breaking the fourth wall or whatever you call it. You know, that that was you know, a little bit shocking to, to my nine-year-old self, <laughs> so, you, know, you know, when, when he said, would, would you like to be the artist of the ghoul lunatic sequences and featuring the Crypt Keeper, the old witch and the vault keeper, you know, I said, yeah, that would be great. So that was something that was right down my alley and that, you know, he kind of got me back into comics. And then when he went to paper cuts and, you know, we're, we're doing the parodies and Stefan Petruca was writing these funny stories um, you know, I got to, you know, I got to, to do them. And, uh, the, I remember, um, he told me, uh, on the first one was Harry with well, the first one was sorry of a stinky kid. And, yes. uh, that was, that pissed off Jeff Kenny, I think who did diary of a wimpy kid. And Jeff, <laughs> if you're listening to this, I'm, I'm sorry, but, um, I did the best I could. At least it looked like your character, you know? Yeah. Um, and I and I owe Jeff Kennedy a, a huge debt of gratitude because, you know, Jeff Kennedy is um, he's represented his uh, publishers is Abrams Comic Arts. And that's the publisher that I, I've done my first uh, graphic novel for. Oh, wow. And Jeff Jeff's work is so popular and he sold hundreds of millions of books. And that has really been a great, you know, Charles Kochman deserves a lot of credit for recognizing, you know, what a great cartoonist Jeff Kennedy is and what you know, how popular his books were going to be because they made so much money that they can afford to take a chance on an unknown like me, you know? I would say unknown. Well, I know I was trying to be funny. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, it's great talking to you. Um, how are we doing for time? Good. I just, uh, I, and one more thing I, I'd like to ask you is, you know, um, what do you consider yourself? Are you a artist in the most broadest sense are you yeah. a traditional artist? Are you a comic artist? Yeah, Which... I, I call myself a cartoonist. cartoonist. I call myself a cartoonist, and I think really in my in my heart of hearts, I would like to have been a New Yorker cartoonist. You know, do okay. single panel gag cartoons for the New Yorker, and I've you know I've done a lot of that stuff, but you know I ha I haven't really submitted anything to them in years. Mm -hmm. But I think my I I like all of you know I, I have a hard time you know just picking one thing. You know, I've, I like all different. I like the, my favorite thing of, about being an artist is getting an idea. And, you know, some the ideas you don't really, you know, you don't know where they're coming from mm -hmm. and you don't really know what it's going to be. It's like it's like fishing to a certain extent. You know, you go out into the ocean. There are all kind of fish out there. You know, uh, maybe there's some people that are fishing for certain kinds of fish. I'm just somebody that puts his line in the water and see what and sees what happens. But I get ideas. for I, I was still getting ideas for things that would fall into the fine art category uh, long after I had been working in comics. And from time to time, I still get ideas for things that are in the fine art category. And and uh, uh, I won't describe any of the thing, you know, that I've done recently, but, you know, I think most everything I've done that, that's any good is probably in one of my Facebook albums. And I've got a hundred and something albums on Facebook, more stuff than anybody you know needs to see. But um, I love, I love getting the idea. And in, 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 uh, in comics, you know, uh, is storytelling. I also love telling a story. You know, I think that one of the things that I've always, that my, life as an artist is really about is I'm trying to make some kind of connection. I want to make a connection with another person. You know, I want to, I want to connect things, you know, in, in my own mind, you know, sometimes you'll some of the work that I did as a fine artist was, was gathering disparate parts or different things that did not go together 
and combining them in a way that actually seemed like, oh, I see, these things do fit together. It doesn't fit together the way anybody else would have put it together, but I can see it fits together in, in this and in the way he did it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I liked I liked that, you know, making putting putting things together, you know, and, and uh, if somebody likes your work, you know, if somebody likes you or somebody likes your work, that's a nice feeling. You know, if somebody or if they laugh at your joke or or they, you know, they smile at the right time or mm-hmm. you can see it in their eyes. I was at a comic book show in Greenfield, uh, the West Western Massachusetts comic book show last weekend. Lisa and I were there and it wasn't a big show, but there were some young artists that were coming through there. And um, I, I was talking to them. I like to to talk to young artists because I've got this experience. And I just think, you know, that you, you got to at some point you have to try to, you know, you want to say something to somebody that might make a difference in the person's life. And, you know, you can see it in their eyes sometimes. If And I tell people right away, you're free to walk away at any time if I start boring you, you know, <laughs> they stand there. You know, this one guy, I remember he was standing there and he was looking at me and he was an artist and I said something to him and I could just see it in his eyes. I don't remember what I said, but I could just see it in his eyes that, you know, kind of a, 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 a bell rang or a light went off or something. And he got something from that conversation. I felt a connection to this person. I felt that I had given him something that was going to last him, you know, his whole lifetime. And I suppose that when he gets old, he's going to do that probably for somebody else. But, um, you know, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy being uh, anything, but it's really not easy being an artist. You know, you don't have a lot of uh, people coming up to you, giving you advice about, you know, what to do. But um, I always tell people just, you know, have a dream and then make it happen. That's what you got to do, because I discovered that we all have what it takes to be successful at whatever it is that we want to do. Not everybody wants to be an artist or not everybody wants to be a musician. But if that's something you want to do and you're willing to work your ass off, you can probably do, you know, you can probably make some make some nice sounds, you know, make some nice music. So So, that's the great lesson in my life. Just do it. (laughs) Speaking of fans, where can fans find you online? Where can they see what you're up to? Where can uh, they see? Well, um, I'm I'm working on my new website. Okay. It is called rickparkerartist.com. Okay. And uh, we we just started working on that, but that'll be up uh, soon. And I hope we'll have you know interesting stuff on there. Mm-hmm. But you know, um, I'm still posting on Facebook every day or two. Right. And uh, you know, if there's anything, you know, I've I've got a lot of people that I'm friends with that I've never met in person, but I, you know, they seem to be interested in my work. So if I'm going to, if I do something, I want to share it with somebody that would be where it would be. It would be on my Facebook page, but, um, and I'm going to be happy. I'm going to have a show this fall at the university of, uh, uh, Massachusetts in Lowell, an art exhibit. It'll be a solo show. That's something I'm looking forward to. I'm going to be going around to different bookstores and places in, um the country uh talking about my book which comes out september 24th it's okay. called drafted in case anybody was wondering yeah but um you know i'm i'm easy to I'm, I'm i'm a little bit too easy to to find actually well i hope you're coming to new york on that book tour i'm going to be at the new york city comic convention in october okay. my book will be out and i'm planning on giving some kind of uh lecture or presentation or reading or something at the New York city comic convention. I think Abrams is probably going to set that up. Okay. I'll also be at heroes con in North Carolina and June 14th, 15th and 16th. And Lisa, my wife, Lisa Trusiani will be there as well. Okay. And we're going to be guests at the San Diego comics con this year. I've never been an invited guest before, so I'm thrilled. I haven't been there since 2009. So it's been, 15 years since I've been to San Diego. So I'll be there at that. If anybody wants to find me, I think they're going to give me a table Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you never get rid of me or it. And we are back. Yeah. Rick is a really honest guy. We'd love to have him back when that graphic novel comes out. I think it's going to be end of the summer. Uh, so we'll plan something around that, but yeah, you know, it's funny because he talks about his love for art and stuff and, you know, his working on Beavis and Butthead and you know it's really such a, a a wide range of different things he's worked on um rick we thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us uh and we can't wait to speak to you again we can't thank you guys enough for listening to us uh remember june 15th uh voting will be open 
for the uh, podcast awards. There'll be more information on that on our Dodman Bandits uh, Facebook page and the Dodman Banter Facebook page when that comes available. So please be sure to go over there, check it out, and vote for us. So have a wonderful weekend. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Go to your local comic shop, hit up those dollar bins. Uh, spoil yourself, guys. You're worth it. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye.